Chapter 38. Soldiers Kill Our Women We were all camped down near the southern border of the plains, and a large party of us went down to the San Saha and Lana rivers, and got a big lot of horses. Those early settlers were very kind to raise horses for us, for it saved us a lot of trouble. As we were leaving that region, our scouts reported that we were being followed by the rangers, so we hurried along and outran them. When we reached our camp, we found it had been attacked by a body of soldiers and some Tonkaway Indians, and a number of our women were among the slain. Several women and children were made captives and had been taken to Fort Griffin. When the attack was made on the camp, most of the squaws ran away and hid, but five of them were killed while escaping. We arrived the next day and after the fight and found the dead body scattered about. I remember finding the body of Batsina, a very brave warrior, lying mutilated and scalped, and alongside of him was a horribly mangled remains of his daughter, Nuki, a beautiful Indian maiden who had been disemboweled and scalped. The bodies presented a revolting sight. Nearby lay a lot of empty Spencer carbine shells, telling mutely of the heroic fight old Batsina had put up in defense of his own. His Spencer rifle was gone, of course, but I have no doubt that it worked deadly execution before it was taken. Other bodies were mutilated, too, which showed the hand of the Tonk away in the bloody battle. We soon found our scattered women and children and old men, and heard the sad tales of the attack, and our rage knew no bounds. Five of our women and several children were captives in the hands of the soldiers. In our council, we swore to take ten captive white women, and twice as many white children and to avenge the death of our squaws, especially Nuki. We vowed to kill a white woman for each year of her age, she was about 18 years old, and that we would disembowel everyone we killed. Some of the warriors were going back into the settlement at once, and starting in on our revenge, but we were so badly demoralized that we had to get our forces together and move to another part of the country before seeking vengeance. We went up far on the plains, and Kana Parker and four other Indians came to us and urged us to go on to the reservation, saying that the Indians' world of life was over. Kana told us that it was useless for us to fight longer, for the white people would kill all of us if we kept on fighting, but that if we went on to the reservation, the great white father at Washington would feed us and give us homes, and we would in time become like the white men, with lots of good horses and cattle and pretty things to wear. He said the white men had us completely surrounded, that they would come in on us from every side, and we had better give up. Some of the braves wanted to go to the reservation at Fort Sill, and some did not want to go, so there was much disputing and arguing. Connor remained with us about four days, promising us that if we would go to Fort Sill, we would not be punished or hurt in any way, and that all would be well with us. Finally, our hand agreed to go in, and when Connor started, we went along with him. There were several of us who went reluctantly, myself, History, Kodapa, Esatima, and Watskatova. We started on, and Kana sent scouts ahead to notify the soldiers at Fort Sill that we were coming in, and to give us all protection. In a few days, we began to meet white people everywhere, but as Kana could speak English, we got along all right. We were within about 15 miles of Fort Sill when I saw a cloud of dust and heard the soldiers coming to meet us. I was riding a black mare and a pretty swift animal, so I turned and rode for life back toward the Wichita Mountains. Kana took after me and ran me for three or four miles before he caught me. He told me there was no need to be afraid, that I would not be hurt. I would not agree to go with him, then he told me to go to his camp, and gave me directions how to get there. When he got back to the crowd, the soldiers were there and had my comrades surrounded. All were disarmed and were taken on to Fort Sill, where they were placed in a stockade and kept prisoners for some time. I followed Khan's instructions and found his camp without being seen by the soldiers. My comrades were made to work around the post and to do farm work, with which they were not familiar. I stayed with Khan and herded his horses for him, haunted occasionally, and soon became somewhat reconciled to my situation. After they had been at Fort Sill for a while, two of our Indians, Esatima and Eshido, who had to stand guard and watch cattle, allowed some of the cattle to get away. They were punished for this and had to chop wood. This so exasperated them that they planned to escape, and when one of the Indians asked their guard for some tobacco, the other knocked him in the head with an axe. He fell, and they secured his gun and ammunition and ran away. Chapter 39 Attempt to Assassinate Me I had not been with Kana Parker very long before I discovered that there were a good many Apaches in that region who had been brought under control of the government 
and among them were some of my old tribe in whose breasts still lurked the spirit of revenge. But they would make some kind of attempt to kill me, I had no doubt, so I was on the alert. One night I was riding along by myself, returning from taking a bunch of horses out to grass, when suddenly several shots were fired at me. It was very dark, but I saw the flashes of the gun and knew where the shots came from. I fell off my horse and lay perfectly still. They fired again, and I raised up and emptied my pistol at the cowards. In a few seconds I heard somebody groaning. I then ran to Kana's, and on the way I passed a big black stump. I did not see this stump until I was right near it, and thinking it was a man, I shot it as I went by. When I reported the matter to Kana, he called up his men and found five were missing. Search was made, and they were soon found carrying a wounded Indian. They had all kinds of excuses, the main one being that they just wanted to scare me. Some cowardly Apaches had hired these Indians to kill me. They had an Apache horse, and that was what gave them away. They finally acknowledged the whole plot. Sometime after this I got very sick and thought for a while I was going to die. Yellow Wolf was a big medicine man and lived with Kana Parker. He boiled a lot of herbs and gave me a villainous concoction to drink, and kept me wrapped in poultices, and nursed me carefully until I recovered. Poor old Yellow Wolf. He died some years ago from asphyxiation while he and Kana Parker were stopping at a hotel in Fort Worth. They blew out the gas. Next morning, Yellow Wolf was found dead, and Kana Parker was almost dead. One day, after my convalescence, Kana wanted me to go to the post with him. We went there, and the soldiers surrounded me and called me Charlie Ross, and as long as I was there, I was called that name. They wanted to keep me at the post, and the commanding officer told Kana my people were still living and I should be sent to them. Kana told me my mother and folks were still alive and asked me if I wanted to go to them. I told him no, that the Indians were my people, and I would not go with the whites. Kana told me he would leave me there at the post with the soldiers, and I became very angry with him, telling him that he was doing me wrong to bring me there and leave me with those soldiers. They took me to talk to a Comanche interpreter named Jones, who said I would have to go to my people, and when I told him I would never consent to go, he said they would take me anyhow. At this remark, I pulled my bow, fitted an arrow, and Colonel Jones made haste to get out of the danger zone. Kana stopped me and told me that he would see that they did not take me, for he was going back to his wigwam with me. I turned and was going to kill Jones anyhow, but he was gone. I went back home with Kana, and we talked over the matter a great deal, and finally I was persuaded to give up. I went to the post and stayed a day. The soldiers were good to me, but I was not satisfied. They put me across the creek with my former comrades, and I lay around. The soldiers furnished us rations and ammunitions, but we yearned for freedom. One Indian proposed to me that we steal a squaw apiece and run away. I went and talked to a girl, and she consented to go. We were to meet that night. My comrade stole another Indian squaw, got two good horses, and made good his escape. My girl was true to her promise, stole everything she could carry, and waited for me until nearly daylight. I started, and when I was nearly to where she was waiting, the soldiers discovered me and gave chase. I ran off of a bluff and fell into the creek and came near freezing, and was eventually driven back to camp. So many soldiers watched me that I had no chance to escape. About this time, General Mackenzie saw my mother in Fredericksburg and told her about me being at Fort Sill. From the description he gave her of me, mother did not think I was her boy. Adolph Korn, whom I had met once while a Comanche party was visiting the Apaches, had been at home for several years. Rudolph Fisher had been sent home about three months before, and I was the only white boy left with the Indians. General Mackenzie came back to Fort Sill and then began to talk to me about going home to my people. Anna Parker told me how to find the way back to his camp, and promised to take care of my horse while I was gone. He said he would be a brother to me, and insisted that if I did not have any people, that I should come back and live with him. Chapter 40 My Restoration I left all of my Indian property with Kana, and in company with five soldiers and a driver, I started to Loyal Valley in Mason County, Texas, to see my mother. We traveled in an ambulance drawn by four mules, and made about twenty miles the first day. Four days traveling brought us into a country where there was game, and the soldier would place a gun in my hands and make signs for me to go out and kill an antelope, and I would always bring home the bacon. 
The fifth day, one of the soldiers went with me, and when we got out of sight of the ambulance, I planned to kill him and run away. But after thinking over the matter, I concluded that I had no place to go, so I decided to give that soldier a good scare anyways. I got the drop on him and made signs for him to lay down his gun. He did not want to, but I soon convinced him that I was in earnest, and he put it on the ground and raised his hands in the air. I pointed toward the camp and said, Vamos. He understood that and lit out for camp in a hurry. I picked up his gun and went to camp myself. The other soldiers laughed at the one who came in ahead of me for letting an Indian boy take his gun away from him, and they made sport of him throughout the trip. I played all sorts of pranks on those soldiers. One morning I grabbed up a blanket, waved it over my head two or three times, and gave the Comanche war whoop. And I want you to know those fellows scattered, and the mules broke loose. They took it all good-natured and seemed to enjoy the fun. We came to Fort Griffin, and the five soldiers got on a big drunk, and all of them were sent to the guardhouse, and a new outfit was selected to escort me. I was allowed to kill game for them too, and do pretty much as I pleased, but they kept an eye on me all the time. We came to a big water hole, and the soldiers caught some big bullfrogs and fried them in lard, but I would not eat them, for it was against the Comanche rule to eat lard. I would not eat with those soldiers anymore. Frogs and swine, both water or mud animals, were too much for me. The second day after leaving Fort Griffin, I jumped off the wagon and shot an antelope. One of the soldiers brought the little animal in, and as he was climbing into the wagon while it was in motion, his foot slipped. The mules jumped and he fell, and the wagon ran over his leg, breaking it. After this, we traveled slowly, camped often, and killed game, but gradually we neared the home of my childhood. We passed through Fort Mason and went on to the Lano River, to the Simonsville Crossing. Here, we began to meet people who had come out from Loyal Valley to wait for us. Word having preceded us that the captive boy was being brought home. When we reached Loyal Valley, we drove up and stopped at a place, and the soldiers made signs for me to get out. Quite a crowd of people gathered around, and among them was my mother, but I did not know her. The years of savagery which had passed over my head had erased from my memory all of the recollections of a mother's love and tenderness, and to me on that hour, which should have been a crowning event of happiness, my mother was no more than a white squaw. Curiously, the crowd examined me, and excitedly talked in a language I could not understand, although it was my native tongue. They looked for marks of indication, and found a scar on my arm that was made when I was a little boy. Soon, my brother and sister, Willie and Mina, came up, and the dark curtain of oblivion which had been drawn so long was pulled back, and to me there came the recollection of my early childhood. I was restored. I recognized my brother and sister and remembered them as my playmates in the far distant past. Then somebody kept saying, Herman, Herman, and that name had a familiar sound. It then occurred to me that that was my own name. Slowly but surely, the mist began to clear away, and I knew I had found my people. But I was an Indian, and I did not like them because they were pale faces. Chapter 41 The Triumph of Mother's Love I was five years old when my father, Maurice Lehman, died. Some years later, my mother married to Philip Buchamer, who died sometime in the 90s. During my captivity, my mother never lost hope that someday I would be restored to her. She had talked with Adolf Korn after she was restored to his people, and he told her that he had seen me with the Apaches and that I was still alive. So when she received word that there was a captive white boy at Fort Sill, she was determined to ascertain if it was me and have me brought home. The meeting related in the preceding chapter was the realization of her hopes that I was her boy, and her prayers for my restoration were answered. In order to give the full details of this meeting, I give below an account which was written by the late John Warren Hunter, who was an intimate friend of our family for many years, he having taught school at Loyal Valley in the early days. This account was published in Hunter's Magazine, 1911. Sometime in 1878, General Mackenzie left Fort Sill and made an inspection of the frontier posts. He passed through Fort Concho, Fort McCavitt, thence to San Antonio. At Old Fort Mason, which is 20 miles north of Loyal Valley, he spent the night. When his presence in Mason became known, friends sent word to Mrs. Buchamer that General Mackenzie would pass through Loyal Valley the day following, and that he was direct from Fort Sill perhaps have an opportunity to learn something of her son. Unfortunately, Mrs. Buchamer was away when the courier came, 
the others were immediately dispatched. But before they reached her, General Mackenzie and escort had passed Loyal Valley and were well on their way to Fredericksburg, where they expected to spend the following night. When Mrs. Bukemer received word that General Mackenzie was expected to pass her Loyal Valley, she rode with the speed of a Bedouin to reach home in time to intercept him. But failing in this, she hitched a team of fresh horses to her carriage, and accompanied by her husband, drove like Yehu, and came up with the general before he reached Fredericksburg. Of the interview with General Mackenzie and its happy results, we will allow Mrs. Bukemer to relate her own story. Time passed away so slowly, I increased my efforts to learn something of Herman. My faith was thoroughly tested. I heard one day that General Mackenzie was coming through Loyal Valley, and I hastened to intercept him, as I thought that would be a good chance to find out if there were any more white boys among the Indians that had come into the reservations and given up. But he passed down before I could get to see him. I got my husband to hitch up and carry me to Fredericksburg. We followed on and overtook the general in his camp three miles this side of Fredericksburg. I was conducted to his tent and knew him as soon as I saw him. I told him when Herman was stolen, and as he had just come from the reservation, I thought perhaps he could tell me something of my boy. He asked me to give him the age and description of my son as near as I could. When I had done so, he said, There's one white boy there, but from his description you give, I don't think he is your son, for he is not that old. He dropped his head and studied for a while, and then he said, Madam, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go on to Fredericksburg and telegraph the soldiers to bring him down, and if he is your boy, I'll be very glad, but if he should prove not to be your son, I will have him taken to San Antonio and place him where he can learn a trade. He has no business with the Indians. He telegraphed the commanding officer at Fort Sill to send an escort with the white boy immediately to Loyal Valley but received the reply that the boy had gone on a buffalo hunt and would not be back for three months. These were the longest three months I ever spent. I could never wait more than two weeks, and I would go to the office and telegraph to know if he had returned from the hunt. At last a telegram came, saying that he had returned, and that the escort would start immediately. Think of my anxiety and joy, mixed with doubt and fear. If he should be my long-lost son, I would be the happiest mother in the world. I counted the days and merry little things brought up doubts and fears. I trembled at everything. I was wholly unnerved. I inquired of everybody who came from that way if they had seen or heard soldiers coming, but I obtained no tidings. One morning a man passed soldiers between Loyal Valley and Mason. These soldiers, he said, had charge of the white boy, and they sent me word that they were coming and would arrive that night. I walked to the floor, only pausing to listen for the sound of their ambulance, but I could hear nothing but the patter of the rain against my window panes. While we were at supper, a large crowd came in and said, Mrs. Bukemer, we have come to take you out to meet your boy. Mr. Bukemer objected to my going out in the rain. He said that my going would not hasten things along any. A school teacher who boarded with us said, Boys, you go and meet Herman. The night is too disagreeable for Mrs. Bukemer to go out, and no one knows what she would do were she to meet him in the road. The boys went out three miles, where they found them in camp. They asked the soldiers to hitch up and drive into the valley that night, and they did so. Meanwhile, the teacher and Mr. Bukemer made me sit down, and they were holding me there. Friends had come from far and near to rejoice with me, if it should prove to me my boy. There were three hundred people present. Closer and closer came the sounds of the wheels of the ambulance, while my heart beat faster and faster. Was that ambulance to bring my boy? It drove up to the door, but they still held me. I tore loose, ran to Herman, threw my arms around his neck, and wept. I then led him to the light, and, great lord, I thought it was not Herman. Mina came up and said, Mama, it is Herman. Don't you see the scar on his hand? That is where I cut him with our little hatchet. Sure enough, a close examination proved it to be Herman. Imagine the joy, the bliss, and happiness the assurance brought me. I shall ever be grateful to General Mackenzie for having my boy brought home. Those who witnessed the Saffy meeting add a number of facts not mentioned by Mother Bukemer. Numbers of them have told me that it was near the noon hour when she received word that the escort would be at Loyal Valley that night. She immediately began preparations for a great feast. She found willing hands among the villagers to aid her. She started runners in every direction to call on friends, far and near. 
Every oven and stove in town was kept hot, baking bread and cakes. Beeves and muttons were slaughtered, and a pall of smoke ascended from pits of barbecued meats. A slow rain began falling in the evening, but that did not retard preparations for the feast, nor did it lessen the attendance. Everybody loved Mrs. Buchamer, knew how she had prayed and trusted, and now that the lost son had been found and was nearing home, they hastened to join in the general thanksgiving. When the boy arrived and she made sure that he was her son, those present relate that never before had they heard such shouts of praise and thanksgiving to God for his goodness and mercy. The good mother was a devout Methodist, and her righteous soul became full to overflowing, and she gave way. There was no dearth of tears of joy that evening, feasting, singing hymns of praise, German and English. Prayers of thanksgiving occupied most of the night. All the day following, the feast was kept up for those who remained, and those who continued to come. During all this time, Herman maintained a haughty indifference akin to Indian stoicism. He had forgotten his mother tongue and could not speak English. He saw every occasion to shun the company of others, and when assigned to a clean feather bed in which to sleep, he refused, preferring to sleep on the ground with only a blanket for a covering. When the escort left, he wanted to return with the soldiers, and was with difficulty restrained. One of his brothers became his constant companion, teaching him his forgotten language, and to prevent him from running away. He was given a few horses and cattle in order that a property ownership might serve to render him content to remain. It was a difficult matter to induce him to wear clothing, and oftentimes he would doff the suit that furnished him, paint himself, and with leggings, breech clout, and feathers, appear among the hotel guests in all the barbaric panoply of a Comanche warrior. A few weeks after his return, a protracted meeting was held under a brush arbor in the Loyal Valley. Herman viewed the proceedings from a respectable distance, and his amazement was extreme. He finally concluded the whites were having a rain dance, and one day, at the eleven o'clock service, when religious feeling became intense and singing and shouting was at its height, Herman dashed into the altar with his war club and engaged in a war dance that had a startling effect. His brothers seized him and led him away, and the service closed without the benediction.